coming up on this episode of the Jeep Talk Show. This week in Jeep, we hear about what Hennessy Performance has done with a Grand Cherokee and a Christmas tree. Ah, don't worry, it's safe for work. And FCA dealers have a big complaint. What's it mean for you and me? In Wrangler Talk, Bill's going to go over recovery gear and what you should be carrying in your recovery bag. Nikki G ate too much ham and smoked some tinsel before calling in to wish us a Merry Christmas. We'll talk about some events, get into some electrical troubleshooting, and a whole lot more on this show. So, stick around. Jeep Talk Show. Celebrating our ninth anniversary. Thank you for being with us along the way. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Are you ready? It's the Jeep Talk Show. With Jeep Mama. Are you sure? Josh. Yeah, I don't think so. And Tony. I think that's a huge deal. So sit back. Strap in and brace yourself. It doesn't matter if you have a Jeep, want a Jeep, or never driven anything but Jeeps, this show is for you. Josh, Tammy, and myself are here to inform and entertain you while we talk about... Jeeps! Santa Claus! No, he's gone. That fat bastard's back Thank in the North God. <laughs> and so, And so are those elf on the shelves. Oh, oh gee. I saw one I where... I can't believe I got suckered into that thing. <laughs> I saw one where somebody had taken... Uh, uh, chicken bones, where they'd eaten all the chicken off oh, the, all the bones. Yes. Do you see that one? Oh, yeah. I and gave they, a nice little fist pump to that one. I was like, yeah, <laughs> it was boy. just the, the elf hat and chicken and chicken uh-huh. bones. <laughs> hey, this is Tony, and this is not a test. Yep, phoning hey. in at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Josh, and despite my utter hatred for slow drivers, there is one thing I hate more, intermittent electrical problems. I'm Tammy. I'm a Jeep girl. I was born with my heart on my sleeve, a fire in my soul, and a mouth I can't control. <laughs> hey, that rhymes. I, it's yeah, really I, true. I, 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 did, I didn't make that up. That was on a sweatshirt I got for Christmas. Plagiarism. That's what that's I, called. I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, she gave credit. <laughs> Local Jeep news, national Jeep news, and news from around the world. It's This Week in Jeep. Well, your Christmas tree may be pretty, but mine is, well, holding a new record. I don't know about you, but the lights and ornaments just can't come down soon enough. It's, what, I don't know, 360-some-odd days till Christmas, and half my neighbors already have their lights up still. Something like that. Some people, I swear. Take I'm so down. done with the holiday season, I'm about to throw myself off the Nakatomi building right behind Hans Gruber. As right. fast as he plummeted to earth, the recent record set by auto-tuning company Hennessy Motors probably has or Hans beat. Although there likely isn't an official fastest Christmas tree over land speed record, one now has been set. The tree made it through the woods to Grandma's house and back in record time. In official terms, on December 19th, 2019, at the Continental Tri- Tire Proving Grounds in, help me out, Tony, uh, you, you've, you've <laughs> you, Uvalde, Uvalde, Texas. Oh, That's what I'm I can. Go with. Yeah, Uvalde, exactly. Oh. I'm hey, doing, yeah, you want I me to help right. you? There's no way I can help you. <laughs> then I saw where it was. Uvalde. That's a great place. Oh, yeah, I got it. At the Continental Tire Proving Grounds in Uvalde, Texas, a 2019 Jeep Grand Cherokee with Hennessy's HPE 1000 upgrade kit reached 181 miles per hour with (laughs) a six-foot Douglas fir from Lowe's strapped down on a suction cup roof rack. Like I said, I'm pretty sure this specific record has never before been set. However, if this is giving you a sense of deja vu, well, you're probably remembering the other Christmas stunt Hennessy pulled off back in 2017. Then they took a Dodge Challenger SRT Hellcat widebody to 174 miles per hour with a little bit of a smaller tree on its roof. In both cases, you can be sure there was a whole trail of pine needles left on the track. If you want to check out the Grand Cherokee Christmas tree run to end all runs, we'll have a link to the YouTube video in the show notes for this episode. You know, uh, I think the uh, Griswolds actually had the tree pointing the other way. I would like to have seen them having the... The tree pointing the other way at 181 miles an hour because this one is the fat end towards the front, which is really mm-hmm. the most aerodynamic uh, aerodynamic way that you'd want to take a uh, Christmas tree down the road, a highway or, or testing track. 181 miles per hour, and it was lit too. It had Christmas lights oh, on it. So well, it would have to be, wouldn't it? <laughs> the, the tinsel was long gone. <laughs> uh, was it too many of a good thing? Is there such a thing? Fiat Chrysler dealers are complaining the automaker is building too many unordered cars and vehicles and SUVs that they don't want, forcing them to make an all-out push to clear away tens of thousands of vehicles in its dealers that its dealers haven't ordered. 
The industry term for this is called a sales bank, and FCA reps have long disputed the term as it applies to the automaker's brand new sales analytics tool. This tool attempts to predict exactly how many vehicles and the exact vehicle trims it should build over the year and when. The tool was introduced by a former Amazon executive in 2018. According to reports, it has saved FCA more than $400 million in the third quarter alone of 2018. Oh God. Yeah, that's a big chunk of change. All that savings aside, the company's 2,400 some odd U.S. dealers are claiming that FCA has been loading up their available inventory with tens of thousands of extra vehicles that they haven't ordered and frankly don't want. Dealers say the sales bank reg- regulates them to buy, buy these vehicles that they view as less desirable and are likely to move slower off their lots. Now, what this means for you and I is that now may be the best time to buy a new car from any of FCA's mainstream brands. But why? It basically boils down to supply and demand over pretty much anything else. Although the guesstimator tool the FCA is using to determine how many of what vehicle to build may be off slightly in its numbers, this means there is going to be an abundance of what dealers consider slow-moving vehicles. No, not slow as in lack of horsepower slow, but just, you know, not very desirable. Base models, ugly colors, and you get the idea. The bottom line is that you have a chance now to take advantage of all that quote-unquote employee pricing plus commercials they are saturating the radio and TV markets with right now. It may not be your ideal Jeep or Ram truck, but you'll likely pay a whole hell of a lot less than the neighbor down the street did for the exact same rig. $400 $400 million in the third quarter alone. In the third quarter alone. Do you do you realize that you could rent Oprah for that $400 million yeah, right? for a year? <laughs> you could get her for a year. Any Anything you wanted her, uh, any event, I should say, that you wanted her to be a part of. $400 million. That's, that's a bunch of money. Um, Just by, by changing the number of vehicles that you make with a certain trim level and when you're making these vehicles. And so it's it's sort of, I'm sure you did a big algorithm behind it and, you know, all this math and everything behind this. And, and obviously, if it worked for something like Amazon, it obviously was applied uh, to a company like FCA uh, and worked very well considering the amount of savings that they were able to put away. It's probably just a Microsoft Excel uh, table with uh, oh, just use, a spreadsheet, using you know, a spreadsheet, a using pivot yeah. tables. It's got several pivot tables in it. So <laughs> that's how they did all that stuff. So that's, uh, that's good. Interesting stuff nonetheless. But yeah, if you are in the market, and honestly, historically, January is a very good month to, to buy a, a brand new vehicle in. Um, you talked with any of the car pro guys, and they're going to tell you about the same thing. January is the month to do this at. So if you are in the market or know somebody who is, well, tell them about this, and this is going to give them a little bit more buying power, but when they get to the dealership, just got to do a little bit of research is all. Well, we want to hear your news tip. Heard an interesting Jeep rumor or read a catchy Jeep-related headline? Or maybe you just want your two cents heard over a story we reported on last week. Let us know by phone or by email. Just head over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and find out how to reach out. You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network Podcast. Now, from Jeeps to Toyotas, from ATVs to Land Rovers, if it's off-road, it's on the 4x4 radio network. We'll see you there. Well, last week we made a big announcement. The Jeep Talk Show was going to be giving away something brand spanking new. On the heels of something we had just given away, a CB uh, with uh, John with uh, Radio Comtech had, uh, had given us a courtesy of Radiosity. Now, this one was courtesy of none other than yours truly, the Jeep Talk Show. And uh, we had uh, said that we needed, uh, what was it, 18 callers, Tony? Uh, Tammy? 17. 17. And 17. It is with our pleasure that this week we take this moment to (laughs) announce our winner. Drum roll, please. (laughs) Nobody. That's right. Not enough calls came in because you guys are lazy and too preoccupied with Christmas or some crap. So here's your cue, people. Go ahead and start calling in right now. We we got a lot of calls. We got a lot of calls. We did get calls. We just didn't get enough calls. So if you ever think that you are a little bit too late to the game, oh no, it's three days after the show came out. It's they've already given that stuff away. No, call in right now. A lot of people. A lot of people think that. Oh, I've already lost out. uh, Nope. Nobody's won. Nobody's won yet, so you can still call. You know, you're listening to this. You can press pause and go call, and you may be the winner. One man. It's with this guy. Who is he? One mission. Who are we talking about? Who is this guy? Who are you? One model of Jeep. What is this? The Wrangler. Who are you? Call me Bill. 
It's Wrangler Talk with Bill. Hello, JTS listener. First, I would like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. So one of the most common questions I get out on the trail is, what do you carry in your recovery bag? And no, it is not a AAA card for out on the trails. Well, first on this talk, I would like to say that when out on the trails, you should always have your Thunder Buddy with you because wheeling alone is not safe and just downright stupid. I want everyone out there to be safe and make sure that everyone gets home in one piece. The Jeep can come home in multiple pieces, but that's kind of besides the piece. But you personally is the key. The first and most important item is a comfortable set of gloves. So, to start, you might want to get a couple recovery points for your Jeep. And I know I'm not talking about just wrapping a toe strap around your front axle or control arm and calling it a day. I'm talking about a frame-mounted hook that will provide a proper point to pull the entire Jeep out of the mud or off the rocks. There are many different types of recovery points out on the market, and if you're buying an aftermarket bumper, you should be pretty much set with the recovery points that are located on the bumper itself. So, it is also a good idea when you're looking at recovery points or something of the sort to have one located on the front and rear of your Jeep, because you never know what kind of situation you're going to get in yourself into out on the trails. And as we all know, you might be the leader of the group and need a tow all the way back to the parking lot by a fellow host or a tow out of a deep mud puddle when you're snapping a rear drive shaft. Yes, thank you, Tammy, for leading my group the rest of the day when we were out on the trails. Although, when talking about recovery points, I would like to cover the fact that a hitch is not a safe recovery point. I've seen pictures and I've actually witnessed out on the trail a two-inch ball breaking off its threaded shaft and going through a rescuer's windshield. And let me tell you, it's really hard to explain that one to your insurance company. So, no. A recovery points on the front and rear of your Jeep And the next item you're most likely going to need to get yourself out of that tight situation is a toe strap. So now your best friend is to find toe strap that is going to be, you know, pretty safe for you to use when you're out on the trail. And when you're looking at toe straps, probably Harbor Freight's going to be the best place that you're going to find some of these toe straps. They sell great high rated toe straps for cheap. And when looking at a tow strap, you're going to need to take the curb weight of your rig and multiply it by about four. And when you do this, this, that will give you a minimum tow rating that you're going to need for that strap. So if your rig weighs about 4,000 pounds, you're going to need to be a tow strap that's rated about 16,000 pounds to, you know, safely tow yourself out of that mud or off the rocks. And that's just good safety factor have when you're out there. So you're not going to be breaking things or snapping that toe strap when you're out there and hurting other people. And personally, I actually have four different size toe straps from Harbor Freight. I can say that at least one or more that are going to get used when you're out, out on the trails. And the key is to have different lengths of toe straps because they're going to come in handy when hitting the trails and you might find that, you know, one size is too long and you're going to have to double it up or you're not able to double it up or vice versa. One's too short and you can't reach from the point of your recovery point that I talked about earlier to your actual rig that you're going to be using to get yourself out of that mud pit. So make sure you have a couple different size toe straps when you're out on the trail, and it will come in very handy. So the next item that you're gonna need to carry in your recovery bag is a couple D-frings, because when you're going out on the trails, you're gonna need to sometimes link those toe straps together. And let me tell you, trying to get those two eye rings that are the ends of your toe straps apart when they are all cinched down on top of each other is pretty much impossible unless you know you have hands of superman or something of that sort so invest in a good set of d-rings and once again multiply your curb weight of 
your Jeep or rig by four. And that's a good point to start with for your braking force on your D-ring. So the next item that you should have in your bag, and this might sound weird, but put an adjustable wrench in your bag. And the only reason I'm saying this is because when you're out on the trails, this might be the most useful tool you will come across when you're out there. It's really nice just to know exactly where that is, that tool is located in your rig and the ease of grabbing it quickly. And finally, the last thing that you want to add to your recovery bag is a snatch block. And the reason I say it's the last thing to add to your rig bag is because a snatch block you need to have a winch. And if you don't have a winch, a snatch block is pretty much pointless. So a snatch block is a pulley that you can separate in half and it will go around your winch cable. And then by using a snatch block and attaching it to a toe strap or something else with a D-ring, you can double your pulling capacity with that item. And make sure when you're looking at snatch blocks that you are buying a snatch block that is actually compatible with the style of cable that you're using on your winch. So there's specific snatch blocks that actually are compatible with metal or cable winches. And also there are snatch blocks that are compatible with the synthetic line. So kind of that's pretty simple to have what you should have in your bag. It's pretty you know, easy, and you're going to make sure that you're, you have the tools that you need to get yourself out of that tight situation. So let's cover. You're going to need a set of comfortable gloves. Make sure they are comfortable because wearing an uncomfortable set of gloves out in the trail or in a, you know, mud bog or something is not going to be very good. You're going to need a couple toe straps, a good set of D-rings, and an adjustable wrench. And finally, a snatch block, if you have a winch. And I'm only saying you need a snatch block because it's just going to help with all different tight situations you're going to get yourself into. So thank you for listening to this week's Wrangler Talk. And remember, if you have any questions or comments, contact us at thejeeptalkshow.com slash contact. And leave us a voice message or send us an email. Pretty simple. And if you have anything you want to hear in future Wrangler Talks, please send them my way. Looking for ideas here. Thank you for listening to this week's Wrangler Talk and talk to you the next week. Got a dead battery? Well, it might be old man Winter's fault. We'll help you find a drain in your Jeep's electrical system in Tech Talk. Are you living the Jeep life? From mall crawlers to weekend warriors, from daily drivers to weekend wheelers, it's all about the Jeep life, and it's all good. It's time for Jeep Life with Jeep Mama. Hey, everybody, finally. You don't have to listen to Tony, Josh, and I singing anymore. Jeep life. Wait, wait, I have another <laughs> intro that I'm working on. <laughs> oh. I, I actually had a good time singing Jeep Life, Jeep Life. Um. So tonight's topic was going to be about being flexible. Yeah. And it Double Tony joint. Josh, Here we go. <laughs> yeah. It was going to be about being flexible on Sleeping in that trips. Jeep for those, the, for that whole yeah. month she learned this. Lots of, lots of stretching. <laughs> um, okay. Everybody stand up. Put your hand behind your head. No, oh. Kidding. Just kidding. But that would be a fun segment to do. Um, and then being flexible was a good lesson I learned on my adventure. Um you know, it's always good to have a plan, but it's important to be able to deviate from that plan. And that was something I really, really wasn't good at. I wasn't good at adapting to unplanned changes. And when I finally accepted that on our trip, I realized those deviations turned out to be a really good thing. But tonight, instead of relating the theme being flexible to Jeep trips, uh, I wanted to share with you how I'm having to relate that to my life. You know, you all know I lost my job and I've been applying for job after job and a lot of Jeep folks reached out to me um, from Facebook to YouTube to the Jeep talk show and you all gave me so much great support and a lot of you told me once a door closes, a new door will open. Well, that door has opened and my life is getting ready to make a big, huge change. So the next couple of weeks are going to be a huge adjustment for me. I'm still going to be part of the Jeep Talk Show. Um, We're still working out how 
I'm going to be a part of that. I have some things in my life that I have to get squared away. And for, for the time being, I'm going to be sending in my Jeep Life segments um, until we can get all those details worked out. And if you want to know what this door that I'm opening, I picked door number three, by the way, um, you will have to tune into my YouTube channel because it's the Jeep channel. The YouTube channel is The Jeep Mama. Just search The Jeep Mama. We'll have a link in the show notes. On Sunday, I'm going to be sharing what this open door is all about. It's going to be so exciting and new and life-changing but really, really scary at the same time. And it's a very, very hard decision that I had to make. Um, So anyway, Sunday on my YouTube channel, I don't know what time yet. So you'll just have to go to my YouTube channel, hit subscribe. And next to the subscribe button is a little bell. And if you click on that bell, that'll give you notifications when I go live. So, um, you know, I was thinking, Tammy, um, this is kind of interesting. You, you, maybe you've already uh, uh, thought about this as well. Uh, it's kind of interesting. You took that month-long uh, trip across country. You had a plan, uh, but everything seemed to change. And oh, yeah. uh, you had to, to deal with that change. And uh, you get back from your, your month-long excursion, and now your life is kind of the same thing. You're, yep. you, it, it's an adventure. Uh, you can, I, I'm, I'm sure that part of you is very excited uh, but part of you is concerned about um, how is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? What, how am I going to handle this? And so on and so forth. But that's just like the, the off-road uh, trip that right. you went on. Exactly. And, you know, you just learn to adapt and you figure it out and it, it's, it's all going to be good. But it's really, really scary when you have to deviate from that plan because you don't know what to expect. Right. But that's what makes it so exciting may you live in interesting times i think was the uh, the chinese curse yeah these are interesting that's for sure um so youtube channel jeep the jeep mama and i'll put um a link in the show notes and you can always go to my blog and find all the links so how does my jeep life compare to yours i'd love to hear your story and share it with everyone else Um, So contact me and share your story. And all you have to do is go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact to find out how. Why did you become a paid subscriber to the Jeep Talk Show? I love the show. I've listened to you guys free for, I don't know, years now. And I figure it's time to give back. You can be a paid subscriber and help support the show you love, the Jeep Talk Show. It'll just uh, help help the show out. And, and then in the end, it'll be Jeep Talk Show in my ear holes, you know? Just go to jeeptalkshow.com and look for the big yellow subscribe button. It'd be nice to give back to uh, so that you guys can continue on. Because if they love the show, then why shouldn't you, why shouldn't you give back just a little bit? Oh, we love you guys taking your time to be a paid subscriber to the show. And, you know, I know it's kind of difficult to do when Christmas is coming up. you got to buy all kinds of stuff, food, gifts, everything. Well, it's a new year. 2020 is around the corner. And uh, after you pay your taxes, uh, you need to pay uh, pay us. <laughs> is that subtle? <laughs> Was that subtle enough? <laughs> it's funny. I saw, I saw a car today and the license plate said, pay me. So Oh, it's, look yeah. at that. So, So, (laughs) pay me, people. So, go over to JeepTalkShow.com and uh, click that uh, paid subscribe button. Uh, Remember us in 2020. You got tech questions? Ah, what do I ever? We have answers. Oh, that's good. It's Tech Talk with Jeep Talk. You don't have to know how to draw in order to find one. Electrical drains can be a pain in the you-know-what. Your ordinarily trustworthy Jeep has left you stranded. Thinking it would start up right right up for you when you came back to it, you've instead found nothing but a dead battery and no explanation. Oh, sure, maybe you left the dome light on, or that stickier worn ignition switch didn't quite turn all the way off before you removed the key. Yes, believe it or not, I've seen ignitions so worn, the tumblers and key so rounded off, that you can literally remove the key from the ignition with the Jeep still running. And I'm not talking about turning it, turning the ignition to just pulling it straight out. But that's not you. You wouldn't leave the CB on or the dome light blazing, and your key is just fine. So what happened? Well, electronics failed. It's just a fact of life. Wiring and connections over time deteriorate, and systems will eventually suffer some form of an issue in its lifetime. Not to worry, there's some easy troubleshooting that any of us can do to help narrow down the troubled circuit. 
The method I'm going to teach you today has been around for decades and is one of the most simplest ways to determine which of the many circuits in your older Jeep's wiring has a parasitic draw on it. For those who may be new to vehicle electronics or who just don't have the experience, a parasitic draw or a drain is a term for an electrical component in your vehicle consuming electricity when it shouldn't, even after it and the vehicle has been shut off. Drains and draws like this can cause all sorts of headaches, especially in newer Jeeps. If you are having an issue where your Jeep is dead every time you try and start it, but it fires right up with a jump, and your battery is less than 5 years old, well, there's a chance that you have a draw. Parasitic drains can present a tiny or a massive load on the battery, robbing it of critical voltage quickly, or in the case of a small drain, reduce the longevity of your battery over time. Fixing this issue can be as varying as the Jeep owner themselves, so I won't be able to give you specific direction for that because it's really going to depend on well, what's going on with your particular Jeep. But I will be able to give you the means to track down this draw and potentially do something about it. Now, there are a few ways to go about this, but today you're going to learn the fuse pull method to determine what circuit is the culprit. This method is by no means the only way to find a draw and really won't work that well on newer CAN system Jeeps. So the only tool that you're going to need uh, are some basic hand tools for removing a battery terminal and a simple test light. That's it. You know, the test lights, the old school ones, like the ones found on every part store tool shelf for under 10 bucks. The first step is to pull the negative wire off the battery, put the test light's alligator clip on the battery post, and wedge the probe side into a crevice on the ground wire terminal you just removed. If the light illuminates, you have a draw. There are systems that will naturally have a slight draw, like the stereo for instance. Aftermarket stereos have a constant hot wire that ensures your settings and presets are remembered after you turn the key off. You will of course want to make sure you have the glove box closed if it has a light, and the doors too uh, so that the dome light is off. And if your Jeep has an underhood light, you'll want to remove the bulb. Basically, you want to turn off all the lights and make sure that nothing's on as you're doing this test. This will eliminate a lot of those false positive you'd get otherwise. Using the owner's manual as a guide or a printout of your fuse block and what each fuse does, go ahead and start pulling the fuses. One by one, pull a fuse until the light goes out. When the light goes out, you have found the circuit that has a draw. Yes, this is going to be tedious, and yes, this is going to take some time but it will help you identify where the problem is and maybe point you in the right direction of a repair. Maybe it's those new off-road lights and the relay is sticking us, sticking a little bit, or that CB has an internal short and is just grounding out and the voltage just keeps dumping out and draining your battery. Or perhaps the ECU, the Jeep's brain, has gone bad in some way. It could literally be a thousand different things and each Jeep is different and will require a different repair. Hopefully this will help you with yours. Next week, we're going to be going over another method to do the exact same thing. We're going to be talking about how to do a voltage drop test on your modern Jeep's electrical system to find a draw. Well, do you have anything to add? Maybe you have a question for Tech Talk. Just jump over to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and send us a message. Let us know what you would like for us to cover on Tech Talk. Alexa, ask the Jeep Talk Show to play the latest episode. Welcome. You can listen to all the episodes of Jeep Talk Show, a Jeep podcast including new episodes, as they are released. For now, you'll start with the most recent episode, but you can change by skipping forward or backward. You can even say how many episodes you'd like to skip. From the mind of Nikki G! Hey, this is Nikki G, and uh, I want to take a minute to thank all the uh, people who worked this holiday season to make our holidays a little more enjoyable like to thank all the people that worked in the travel industry and in the restaurants and the gas stations. And uh, let's also not forget the uh, first responders, the police, the fire, the paramedics, pretty much everybody except animal control. Not you, animal control. Let's not forget the real heroes of the holiday season, the Amazon Prime drivers who worked relentlessly to deliver us our G parts. And here's a hint for you guys out there. Uh, The holiday season, you can order all the G parts you want and you just tell your significant other, I'm getting a package delivered today. No peeking. And they will take that package and and they will put it aside for you. And little do they know it's a G part. And you can just go to Walmart and buy some socks or something to put under the tree. They'll never know the difference. All right, boys and girls, I'll uh, chat you later. You have a good one. Bye. You must have needed this every day. I need it!
It's the Jeep Talk Show's must-have stuff. Pick of the week for your Jeep. And the Jeep Talk Show must-have stuff. Pick of the week for your Jeep. This week is the Smittybilt Atlas doorsteps. These things are freaking cool. Now, the price tag is a little bit up there, $82.99. We're talking $83, but you do get free shipping with that. And you do get a pair of these, one for each side or, you know, two for one side, depending on how you want to set it up. And these things are really cool. They, they attach to your Jeep's doors at the hinge point. These steps allow you to climb up and each easily reach your roof safely. These steps can support up to 350 pounds of weight, meaning uh, for us big guys, no problem. Made from steel, not plastic. These steps are safe and durable. Each step body is black powder coated and the steps themselves feature a clear zinc coating, both designed to eliminate corrosion and help with cleaning. The design features a foldable, highly textured step for a safe grip as well. There's a lot of things that you can use the roof of your Jeep for, but you have to be able to reach it easily and safely first. I think these things would be perfect for the overlanders, especially if you had a rooftop tent and maybe right. you, you needed a way to get up there to sh exactly. adjust things. Or uh, even people that had a roof rack would be... That's uh, what I'm saying. If, you, if you've got a Wrangler and you've got a roof rack, these things are mandatory. And if you're into expedition wheeling or the overlanding stuff at all, and you've got a rooftop tent, oh, come on. Mandatory. Mandated. You must have one of these things because... It's going to seriously be a game changer as far as getting in and out of the top, you know, on top of your Jeep. You know, it's seriously, check out the videos, check out the pictures. And here's something that's a bonus cool thing about these things. On the bottom of each one of these, a built-in bottle opener. I was just how cool say, is that? I wonder if it's a bottle opener. <laughs> yeah. I, how cool is that? When I first saw this picture, I'm like, I was thinking, how does this help them get in their Jeep? The door is closed. And <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, a blonde moment. And I think you can actually do uh, uh, both all the door hinges. So, like on a JKU, you could yeah. have you know two sets of these oh, things. Oh, yeah. That way, yeah, I don't think you'd really need four people getting up on the roof at the same time. No, no. But you could do synchronized no, beer opening. Well, if, if you've got something that you need to get to on the front <laughs> of your roof rack, right. and then you need to get to something in the back of your roof rack, if you got a JKU, I mean, we're talking about a good six feet of difference here. Um, or possibly more. So, you know, there's a chance to, for you to, you know, well, I got to climb up on the tire now. I got to put a foot up on top of the wheel well. Oh, I just, I, I just broke the soft top. Now, it's, this is going to make things a lot simpler. They aren't very chunky at all. They don't really change the profile of your Jeep some. Yes, they are noticeable, but they're kind of techy looking. So they kind of give your Jeep a little bit of that edgy look to it as well. So check out the pictures, check them out for yourself. For just 83 bucks for a pair of these things, for what they actually do for you as far as being able to get in and around your Jeep, it's amazing and worth the price. Well, now that you must have a set of these Smitty Built Hinge Steps for your own Wrangler, we'll make it easy for you. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com and look for the link in the show notes for episode 417. Coming up in a few minutes, we're going to hear a little about some events that are happening in your hometown and around the nation in Wheeling Wear. Josh, the placement of that mistletoe on your belt is inappropriate for this campfire. <laughs> it's on the back. I thought it was to be safe. I don't know. <laughs> Kiss my ass. Oh, anyways. Well, uh, i got another run coming up here in the next week or so as we record this episode. There's an annual run that happened every year with a club that I was a member of for a while. They called it the Hangover Run uh, because it usually <laughs> took place uh, uh, during um, New Year's Day, January 1st which, of course, a lot of people are uh, generally hungover for. Um, this year, I'm not, I'm not really drinking or partying much uh, this year, so um, I thought about uh, crashing the party, as it were, showing up bright and early. God, I wish I had an air horn. Be awesome <laughs> oh, that'd just be the camp at like 6 o'clock. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, that's why they call it the hangover run. There'd be a lot of headaches the, uh, going around. So. Josh's face <laughs> on milk cartons. Have you seen this man? Right. <laughs> <laughs> he was never seen from that's again. Right. I know, exactly. They'll, they'll <laughs> chop his body into little bits. <laughs> Oh uh, well, I hope you make it this on this go. I know last uh, last time you were going to go, you had the uh, the problem with the uh, the not the CPS the uh, cam position sensor. I think was right. what you what the problem you had with. How yeah. can you remember uh, that stuff? Uh, it's a common issue on uh, Cherokees. Uh, yeah, no, but I know, but how did? <laughs> but how do you remember that he had that issue on New Year's? 
Well, it wasn't New Year's. Hey. It was here recently. That, that he oh, had oh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was right around Thanksgiving, and I, I had a, a run planned that weekend. Oh, well, oh, okay. It was like I think Friday night or something like that. The the Jeep took a crap on me, and uh, uh, yeah, so I was I wasn't able to to go on that run. Um, so that was that was a recent thing. It wasn't like you know uh, this time a year ago sort of thing. Oh, but, I was uh, like, jeez. But no, Tony's no. right. Uh, if you are a four liter uh, Jeep owner, then chances are, if you've owned your Jeep for 10 years or so, you are likely have replaced this sensor at least once uh, in that in that period of time. Um, so that's something that that many four liter Jeep owners have experienced at least once in their in their uh, Jeepdom, if you will. Well, lots of luck. And I hope it's uh, uh, are you going to go if it snows? I would think snow would make. Oh, so no, much Absolutely. More fun. Yeah, absolutely. Now there there is a little bit of a call for some ice rain, but that's going to be uh, further east than where I am. I don't think it's going to be elevation based. I think it's it's more a little bit more regional based. I'm going to be a lot further west than what they're calling for for the ice rain. However, if that changes uh, and it's going to be more altitude based than regional based, then I'm going to go ahead and call it off because I, I don't like wheeling in ice. I don't um, blame you. As much yeah, as I like no. being out in the wilderness and everything. Slick rocks with with mud and water and rain and snow is one thing, but when the trails start to get icy, now nah, it, it, that's that's there's there's a line in the sand for me. It, well, it's it, potentially that, I, it's potentially dangerous to your health. I mean, uh, I would think because you get stuck in those places and you're not uh, if you're not well pre- prepared, you could actually uh, get frostbite or, or worse. Yeah, or um, you know, do some serious damage to you or your vehicle or somebody else's vehicle or God forbid somebody else. So yeah, uh, yeah, you just, have better... no control when you're on ice. You, you know, no, you could no, be the best going... wheeler in the whole world, and wonder, yes. especially if you're going downhill. I wonder um, why they right. don't make uh, uh, skates, you know, blades for for vehicles. Uh-huh. Whenever, <laughs> because a skater can skate around on ice so easily. <laughs> well, no, I've seen I've seen some guys. There's been a couple times where I've been up there and it's been near blizzard conditions or we got a massive amount of snowfall the night before and the temperatures are in the teens you know and so everything is just frozen solid uh and i've been up there on those kinds of runs where um a couple of the guys have chains and so we'll put a guy up on point who's got the 40s and he's running chains on his jeep and so we'll let him blaze trail um while you know we've got another guy as a tail gunner who's got a chain uh chains on on his tires uh who can be set up for recovery um, and so with that sort of a system, you can kind of make things work a little bit, but again, it's sort of, if you get caught in that type of a situation, uh, it's not something you would really go out and looking for. I don't want right. to go out and wheel in frozen snow and a bunch of ice and stuff. But if I'm, I'm out there on a planned trip and the weather's nice, but you know, the trail conditions have kind of turned to crap over the last 24 or 48 hours. That's not exactly something that you have a whole lot of control over. Uh, so you might as well be prepared for it. Do you take? Do you keep chains with you uh, on situations like that, just for just in case? I, I I don't. I generally try and keep myself out of harm's way. I really, really don't like ice. And living in the Pacific Northwest my entire life, I can pretty pretty well gauge when there's going to be ice and and when there's not. Right. Um, so thankfully, I've only been in one of those in those situations uh, once, but it was sort of a known issue. We were going up there. We knew that there was going to be a chance of ice. Um, there was a large group. There were people that was up there camping already. I know camping in the snow. Is, some of you people down south think it's crazy, um, but uh, I would do um, everything in the snow. I've yeah. never, <laughs> I've never seen the snow very often, so I was but like, "Yeah, some, let's do it." <laughs> that was that. I, I know I've talked about the story before on on the on the show, but this was the one where we had uh, multiple snatch blocks, multiple cable lines. We had a serious recovery situation where um, a person was, you know, almost dangling off the side of a cliff. Uh, and we spent nearly half the day in, doing a recovery um, that was rather <laughs> tricky, mind you. And with those um, tables and snatch blocks, we were able to pull him <laughs> off the cliff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. But, uh, pull but him no, over the just, edge. <laughs> it's just those things where, you know, if, if unless you're going to put yourself in harm's way, you at least got to be prepared for, you know, those, those kinds of uh, scenarios or situations. So it's, and especially out here in the Northwest when, when the weather is just so crazy. Uh, you know, you can have snow, ice, and rain all in, a, in the afternoon, Yeah, uh, and it, then it still be sunny. <laughs> then you want to be prepared for anything. I, I bet you it's just so incredibly tedious wheeling whenever it's, when you cannot predict what's going to happen on the, on the ice. I, I would think it's like, well, what's going to happen now? You know, and you, mm-hmm. you go and you go, okay, well, let's try this then. Yeah. It's, a lot of it is trial and error. It's unsettling. It's unsettling. But you know. Um, you know, it's also a matter of seat time. Um, if you have a fair amount of wheeling experience in a fair 
amount of different kinds of weather and, and conditions and stuff, well, then you kind of don't know what to expect. Okay, it's going to be raining about an inch and a half today. All right. It, I know the trails are going to be slick and there's going to be a lot of runoff and and, uh, and other things. I'm going to be prepared for that sort of thing. I know it's going to be 105 today, so I'm going to make sure that my vehicle is prepared for 105 degree temperature or it snowed six feet last night and it's 13 below. So I better be prepared for this kind of weather, you know, so it's it's really a little bit of common sense and a little bit of preparation. You know, it's pretty funny. I saw a meme or a post about somebody saying uh, we learned how to handle uh, hydroplaning by doing donuts in the field. And it's uh, <laughs> it's really very much like that. You know, you get out in the field, you do donuts, you, you have fun, you get the feel. Uh, it's not so scary when it actually happens when you hydroplane. Uh, you just hope you don't hit anything and you just know to... Yeah. You know, either sit back and enjoy the ride or, you know, kick the wheels over one way or another to stop the spin. So it's uh, it's not bad. It's not bad uh, uh, information to have, not bad experience uh, for you to have as, as long as nobody gets hurt or nothing gets broken. There you go. There you go. Well, um, I don't really have a lot except for my big announcement on Sunday. Don't forget. Well, come on. We got this campfire. We put it all together. Know, you got to have something. Um, actually, I... Still haven't put my back seats back in my Jeep, um, which I, you know, I, uh, my son, Ben, he goes, mom, don't even bother putting them back in. You don't need them. And I was going like, to say, wow. Yeah. I, I, so I think I'm going to leave them out. That's not really all that uncommon. I don't know about where you guys live, but out here in Oregon, um, a lot of people with the JKUs are running them as if they were a two door Jeep and the back seats are yeah, nowhere to be found. <laughs> I, yep. I can't. I mean, it's probably I don't know once a week, a couple times a month at the very least. I'm in a parking lot. I you know park next to a jeep, and as I get out and I walk by, I'm, I'm going to look over. Hey, no back seat. You just kind of those things you yeah. notice. And I, I I'm a big noticer. I notice things and, and stuff. So it's just kind of one of those things. Uh, yeah, it's it's all too common out here. I don't know. Maybe it's just people buying four door jeeps. They don't have a family. They don't need the back seat. So why not? Right. Right. So, so, Tammy, do those bolt and unbolt, or do they actually have a mechanism that allows you to latch them in and unlatch them easily? No, they're um, they're bolts, and actually the bolts go right through the frame. So you have to I put the I put the bolts back in, good, because um, I don't need to be having you know mud and yuck getting the jeep and then little creatures crawling in well i wouldn't want to have to uh, because bolts get lost so easily so maybe not with you you probably put in a bag and mark yeah i do i do but it's uh, funny i still have um bolts from my sahara that and i had written down you know (laughs) blah 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 bolts or lug nuts from sahara yeah, dealership so. called. They want those back, by the way. A lot, right. a lot easier to find uh, if they're in the holes, so that works out right, well. Right, exactly. So I just left, I, you know, I'm just going to leave it out. And um, I actually, the little board that I made for my bed, um, on my way back from Colorado when I was heading back here, um, one of my uh, containers fell over, and it happened to be the container with the gear oil in it. Oh, and no. it was one that was partially used, so I had to throw oh. away the mattress because it got soaked with gear oil, and the little board um, had a gear oil stain on it. So I cleaned it off as best I could, put some kitty litter on it, and I just used what it kills kill. Did I say that right? Kill. Yeah. yeah. So I spray painted it with kitty litter. Yeah. So I I spray painted it with that, and then. I just happen to have all this purple spray paint. So hey, there you go. <laughs> I, I used that up and spray painted it purple. So so for, uh, for those out there who maybe have never experienced gear oil in, in all of its glory, um, 30 weight or 90 weight gear oil, that the really heavy, thick stuff, it smells horrible. Uh, and, yes. and it's not just, oh, I, I, it's, it's unpleasing smell. It is a strong smell. And it is not very pleasant, and and so it's it's if you get that in the interior of your Jeep, you're going to be smelling that forever. Uh, there's mm-hmm. a chance, at least, unless you are very diligent about your cleanup. And if you spill it on something like a mattress pad, oh Tammy, I'm yeah, sorry, that, that sucks. <laughs> there's yeah. there's no worse mess to try and clean up. You you did the right thing. You just got to throw the I damn just thing threw out. The way, yeah. yeah, it was the um. It was the mattress for a mattress, and I actually got two of them from the company, so it all worked out good. And um, anyway, that was 
I had to sleep in it because it spilled the day I left Colorado. Oh. And so that night when I stopped at a campground, because um, it took me 23 hours to get back to Colorado, I'm like, God, that smells. And I looked, I moved some stuff around. I'm like, shoot, this, this bucket that I had all my oils in had fallen, oh, it tipped over because I didn't pack right. Note to self. Was that there the, you go. Was that the night that you had that long dream that wouldn't wouldn't stop that you were changing the uh, the the diff cover, changing the diff <laughs> cover over and over, over and, and over uh, again. Uh, <laughs> I remember you yeah. uh, commenting on how bad that smelled when you first uh, oh were putting gosh, the new covers yeah. on the armored actually, uh, armored covers. Yeah, you can um, the Riddler. Yeah, uh, you can see you can he- hear my reaction in the video of me changing when I did the install. Um, on YouTube, I was like, and I had a bucket that was too high to pour the diff, um, to let the gear oil leak out in. Um, so I couldn't get my hands right to do whatever <laughs> I needed to do. So it spilled all over. And yeah. no, I had, yeah, actually, I had my hands in there and I needed to push the bucket in because it was too high. So if you ever change your gear oil, don't wear have gloves. a really tall bucket. Yeah, and wear gloves and don't have a wear tall gloves. bucket. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And put some cardboard down, too, because you don't want that on the, oh. uh, the concrete. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude, I've got so many stains in my garage. It's not even funny. So, yep. um, I, uh, I I hope you guys had a good Christmas. Uh, I uh, My Christmas was, yep. was okay. You know, you have a certain number of them, and they, they all get kind of predictable. And it's nice, but, you know, it's just like, eh, it's the same old thing. The food's good, right. that type of thing. Yep. But uh, I had a, a very special bonus this year. My uh, oldest son came by with uh, his uh, girlfriend and announced to everybody that uh, they'll be getting married in January, and they are going to be having a daughter in June. Oh, congratulations. Hey, congratulations. Ooh. So I have, uh, awesome. this will be uh, the first grandchild from uh, one of my children. And oh, uh, so you're looking forward to that. A bit nervous about, uh, you know, the Grandpa Tony, the child being uh, okay. You know, I think everybody, every parent, when, oh, yeah. before they've had a child, they're always worried about, is the child going to be okay? Is it going to have all its fingers and toes and all that? So yeah. now, now if, you, if you're a parent and you went through that, you get to go through it again when you're going to be a grandparent. <laughs> just want to just want to help you out with a little cheery statement <laughs> so anyway it was uh, that was great news happy to hear it and you uh, you want your children to be happy and and uh, i think uh my son is uh is uh, well on his his way to uh, uh being very happy well now i can call you grandpa and i feel guilty about it <laughs> oh do you do you actually feel guilty that's no, great no <laughs> like i have feelings Hey, would you like to join in on the Campfire Side chat? Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and find out all the ways you can reach out to us and join in on the fun. Now, let's get to some events from around the world and maybe even in your neck of the woods. Don't forget to let us know about an event that you are planning or involved with, volunteering with. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact. Click and fill out our wheeling wear form. The information comes straight to us. We will get it out to the rest of the Jeepers out there. Coming up, we on the uh, January twenty fourth through the twenty sixth. It is the uh, Winter Fun Festival presented by the California Four Wheel Drive Association. This is happening in Grass Valley, California. It's weekend long event, and uh, well, it's been, they've been doing this for uh, many many years now. Go check it out. Uh, happening uh, the twenty fifth through the twenty sixth, the same weekend, basically in Tempe, Arizona, we have the twenty ninth annual Arizona Military Vehicles Collector Club Arizona Military Vehicle Show. This is a cool one. If you are into military vehicles at all, uh, some of the old Willys, Jeeps, and stuff like that, you know there's going to be a lot of those there. This is the show for you. This is the 29th annual, meaning they've been doing this for almost 30 years. There's a lot of cool stuff happening behind this show. For more event, more information, more events, and links, visit the JeepTalkShow.com website for this episode. I'd like to see that military vehicle thing. I bet you that would be a blast. So on the website, um, they've got uh, pictures uh, from each previous year, uh, and you can go back through the archive. There's an um, entire uh, media section where, where all of the, the news uh, that, that talks about this, all that stuff goes in there. I mean, there you can live vicariously through the <laughs> show, through their website, even if you can't make it to Arizona for the show. There is a ton of stuff there to look at on the website, so they do a very good job. Uh, post information on that website. So again, if you want that link, you got to go check out the show notes for this episode. 
That's it for the show for this week, my fellow Jeeper. Until next week, be sure to check out our Instagram feed. And as always, thank you for listening to the world's most downloaded Jeep podcast. This is a customized message for you. Yes, you. No, not somebody else, but you, the one actually listening to this right now. How do we do it? We've got the technology. Our records show that you, listener 71342B, trust me, that is your number, write it down, has not yet followed us on Facebook yet. I don't care if you're in the middle of something, stop and go to Facebook right now and friend us or whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing so that I stop getting all these indicators that this listener or that listener has downloaded the show but can't seem to push that little follow button on Facebook. I swear, don't give this children. What is this world coming to? Okay, so who's next? Okay, cue up the next one. Hey, not ready for the show to be over? Well, we can understand that. Now you can hear more Jeep Talk Show goodness by installing the Jeep Talk Show app. Just go to Apple or Google Store, search for Jeep Talk Show, and hit that install button. Not only will you have the latest episode, but our entire library of shows. Plus, and only on the Jeep Talk Show app, you'll have access to bonus content. Look for the bonus content icon on the Jeep Talk Show app and hear what goes on after the interview and after the show. Podcasting since 2010.